and welcome to Madison's Notes, the official podcast of Princeton University's James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. I'm your host, Annika Nordquist. We are only a few short weeks away from President Biden's student loan forgiveness plan going live, the culmination of many years of debate in the American public arena. For today's discussion, I've brought in one of the foremost experts on this subject, Dr. Beth Akers, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Beth is an economist specializing in the economics of higher education. She's previously worked at the Manhattan Institute, the Federal Reserve, the Brookings Institution, and the Council of Economic Advisors under George W. Bush. Beth, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Annika. So I want to start by framing this question in terms of the narrative about the issue of student loan debt versus the reality, Um, because you're someone and you've spent a whole career kind of doing a deep dive on student debt from an economic perspective. And there is a narrative that we encounter so commonly about the way that it works in the media. But when you've kind of dug into the numbers, what, if any of that, has turned out to be true and what about it has turned out to be narrative as opposed to what the facts are? Yeah, great question. And I have spent a ton of time trying to understand that. Um, you know, when I first started doing research on student loans, I was really frustrated by the dissonance between the way that economics looked at investments in education and the way that the popular media was covering the idea of investing in education and paying for it with debt. So, you know, I struggled to understand why when people were getting a good financial return on a college degree, um, why it wasn't working for them to use debt in order to finance that investment. Because it seems like, you know, if you're better off in the long run because of the additional money that you've made from having your degree, um, you know, having a small debt to pay off in the, in the meantime, you know, seems like a reasonable trade off. So what I've done is try to understand, you know, what is the real burden of debt for people? And what we find is that actually the typical borrower is in a pretty reasonable financial position. On average, borrowers are spending about 4% of their monthly income on student loan repayment. Um, That's not a high share. That's like on par with what people are spending on things like entertainment. So it's like movie Mm. tickets and mini golf admission, stuff like that. (laughs) So it's not a huge number. That's at the middle of the distribution, of course. That's for the average borrower. So what we know to be true is that, you know, for the, the majority of borrowers, this is a system that actually works pretty well. And for a minority of borrowers, they're actually in trouble. And so what I'd like to say is that it's not really that the system is just broken for everyone, but rather that we've created a system that's really risky, that some people are making investments in college that don't pay off, um, even though on average, the return is quite large. And so what we should be focusing on is those instances where people go to college, they don't get a great job after they finish, or they don't have the earnings that would justify the upfront cost. And then what do you do? And I've got lots of answers to that, but I'll just leave it there for you <laughs> for now. Yeah. I mean, what one area that maybe I'd like you to dig in a little bit more on is the demographic trends with this kind of debt, because that's something mm-hmm. I've always found very interesting in your discussions on this topic. Can you yeah. comment a little bit on, because it doesn't seem like it's random where this debt is hyper-concentrated, who has most of this unpayable debt and who has the hardest time paying it off? Yeah. Okay. So just in general, when people are finishing bachelor's degree programs, on average, they're ending up with about $30,000 in debt. Um, The reason is because we have pretty aggressive limits on borrowing for undergraduate programs. So the sums that you hear about in the popular media that are the six figure, you know, over $100,000 in debt, that's less than 10% of the outstanding balances. And those Mm -hmm. are generally held by people or actually almost always held by people with graduate and professional degrees because they've been able to borrow beyond the federal cap on the undergraduate borrowing. Um, And in in the graduate plus loan program, they're actually able to borrow without limit. So that's how you get those very high balances. Fortunately, those people tend to be very high earners as well because the more education you get, the more income you have. And so when we look at who is struggling to pay back their loans, it's not the people with six figures in debt, as you might think, right? You think more debt must be more unaffordable. Turns out that some of the people who are struggling the most are people with teeny tiny balances, people with less than $5,000 of outstanding debt. 
And the reason for that is that these are people who started college, borrowed to pay for a semester or two at a community college, but then didn't finish. And this is where mm -hmm. there is a real crisis because right. when you've made an investment that gives you this ticket to go out into the labor force and find a good paying job, then the math works out. But if you've made the investment but never crossed the finish line, you're sort of up a creek, right? Because the, the it doesn't make sense. You've made an investment with necessarily no return. And even though it's a small balance that you need to repay, it can actually be really unaffordable because you're someone with uh, relatively low earnings. And so I think that relates pretty neatly to the, the question of the day, which is Biden's recent student loan relief, um, you know, politicians deal in narrative. And so it's not surprising that in some ways it kind of targets the narrative of student loan rather than the reality. But when you look, look at kind of how this has been executed, do you think it's going to help the situation or do you think it's going to make it worse? And, and one thing that I'll add to that is you mentioned that people who owe less than 5000 are the ones who uh, have the hardest time paying off the debt. Um, and Biden is forgiving up to 10000 So is that going to cut these small debt holders completely off the hook? Well, it is. And in fact, if there's a silver lining in a policy that I overall dislike, it's that we're wiping all those small balances off the books. Um, generally speaking, I'm I'm really disappointed by this move. Um, you know, I think that the problems that we have with student lending and higher ed finance in general are really nuanced. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we needed a new nuanced solution. And instead, we got a really blunt instrument <laughs> being used to try to fix the problem. And the result is that instead of taking the scarce resources that our government has to throw at this problem and giving them to the people who are in the highest need, we're just kind of throwing money up in the air. And a lot of it is going to land with people who are already doing quite well for themselves. Mm. Um, so we have you know, borrowers are eligible for either 10 or up to 10 or up to $20,000, depending on whether they received a Pell Grant when they were in college. So basically people who came from less well-off households, but really up to middle class, um, those people are eligible for up to $20,000 in cancellation. Um, you know, again, you know, some of the lowest earners have very low balances, so they're benefiting much less than that, you know, potential upper limit. Whereas people who were coming from, um, more well-off households who might be have gone to expensive institutions or gone on to graduate school, they've got the large balances and will be getting the full extent of that cancellation. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm really disappointed with this effort, but my biggest criticism of it is not even the unfairness of the distribution of benefits, but rather what it does going forward. Um, I'm really concerned what happens when you send a message to student borrowers that when you borrow through the federal loan program, you don't need to pay back those loans. I think we're really pushing students to say, okay, well, if I'm not gonna have to pay this back, I might as well pay more for school, go to more expensive college. I might as well borrow more and borrow to maybe go for that spring break trip I couldn't afford otherwise. You know, basically it's an increase in demand for higher ed services which economists believe basic economic models tell us in general increases prices. And tuition inflation is already one of the core challenges that we're trying to address in higher ed finance. So I think we've only kind of shot ourselves in the foot in exacerbating that problem going forward. And that's the piece of this that I'm the most concerned about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there are a lot of places to jump off from there, but I, I want to harp a little bit on this idea of supply and demand because, at, you know, when I took Econ 101, it feels like the way that college loans uh, have played out kind of buck everything that I was taught about how this works, right? That like people on the one hand are like loudly complaining that college is so expensive and at the same time they're buying the product in higher and higher quantities um which <laughs> yeah. is like really crazy when you think about like the way that at least in theory economies work and right. so 
You've already kind of alluded a little bit to this, talking about why college is so expensive, part of it being inflation. I mean, I guess I want to ask what's happening psychologically that this can be the case, that you can have on the one hand such a vocal outcry about how expensive it is, and on the other hand, increased demand. Well, there are a lot of reasons, and we can't hang our head on a single thing. You know, we've seen um, lower levels of state investment at, you know, in their institutions, um, which is transferring a lot of the additional cost onto their students through tuition and fees. That's one piece of it. You know, we have seen growth in the administration at institutions, which makes them more expensive to operate. Um, we have seen more luxurious amenities developing on these campuses. But they think those are all, all a small piece of what's happened. And I tend to want to step back and say, you know, what is it that's driven people to be willing to pay those prices? You know, it's almost like those are the consequence of the increased willingness to pay. Mm -hmm. And where did that increased willingness to pay come from? I think that for a long time in this country, we have been sending the message to young people that unless you get a college degree, you have not achieved the American dream, you know? So it's sort of, you've got the, you got to have a house, you've got to have a white picket fence, and you have to have your bachelor's degree diploma hanging on the wall, right? That's the, the collection of goods. And I think when, when you've basically told people that without a college degree, you're not a success, um, you're going to get people signing for whatever price it is they have to pay. And, and basically you don't feel like they have another option. Um, I know Pete Buttigieg mentioned this in one of the um, Democratic primary debates years ago now, and someone asked him a question about the cost of college or loans or something, and he said something to the effect of, we need to make it affordable for people not to go to college. And I thought that was a really nice way of putting it, is basically saying, you know, when we have told people that the path to career that doesn't involve college is an unacceptable one, then people are going to pay whatever they need to pay in order to get in and through college. So I think we need to celebrate other career paths and, you know, also think about what other pathways can get people um, from their youth into lucrative careers that allow them to live meaningful um, and productive lives without college degrees. And in effect, that will end up lowering the price. So do you think then that, because, I mean, on the one hand, I and plenty of others who've been to, uh, you know, institutions of a certain tier have seen administrators pour money down the drain, approving like student research projects to go to the Swiss Alps and like other ridiculous. I mean, that's an actual example of like I had a friend actually do that. Yeah, I mean, this yeah. was pre-COVID, so I think the belt has tightened at least a little bit. Um but people can, you know, any of us can definitely think of examples of very extreme waste. On the other hand, colleges, seem, you know, smaller universities in particular, do still charge a high sticker price and are still kind of going out of business, many of them. Um, and it's a trend that I think is going to continue. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how that kind of interplay could exist? On the one hand, it seems like so many colleges charge so much more than they have to. And on the other, it seems like the economic model doesn't really allow them to exist as is? Well, you know, it that that um, program sending your friend to the Alps or whatever doesn't bother me as much as it bothers right. other people. Right. Because <laughs> I actually think it's fine for us to have a really heterogeneous marketplace for higher education. Yeah. And, you know, if at the same time you're paying for your post-secondary degree, you want to indulge in an existence that's something like being a member of a country club, good on you. Go for it. And they can they can charge you a price as long as it's not um, being heavily subsidized to taxpayer dollars. They can charge you a price that's on par with that service that they provide. Mm -hmm. For families and students who do not just have a pile of cash to burn, I think there's been a growing sense that you need to look at the value proposition of the college that you're considering. And I think that it is pushing or putting new pressures on some of these less elite, but still very expensive institutions. Um, you know, if you're paying for a country club style experience, but that's not matched with an elite educational experience, I wonder if the market for that type of service is declining. I think we may be seeing that with some of the closures that we have seen in recent years. 
Um, but you know, the world has been a bit of a crazy place for the last couple of years. And so declines in enrollment that we have seen over that time, I'm not sure if they'll persist once, um, we get past, if we ever get past this COVID situation. Um, but time will tell. And do you think like when we think about COVID, because it seems like in so many areas, COVID was a turning point. Um, and it seems like it should, in theory, like have really affected the way a lot of people think about whether or not a college degree is worth it and how much money it's worth, right? Because you were getting, you were pay paying the same sticker price. And the reason you're paying the same sticker price is presumably because the degree is actually still worth the same amount just because of the prestige and such, even though what you're actually getting in terms of the educational opportunity was obviously right. so much less. Um, so it was just like interesting to me to watch the way that people thought about their education change so much. And yet colleges have not seemed to factor that in to their pricing system. In fact, tuition increased at a lot of schools. Um, do you have any thoughts on how that could be the, the case? Why has that been so stagnant? Well, you know, I think what we're seeing is that people actually do value the in-person aspect of education, even if it's not contributing precisely to the educational experience. So there's clearly a package of services that people are willing to pay for that they believe have value, even if that value is consumption value rather than investment value. And so I think that, you know, explains why people are willing to pay continually these higher prices. But it was kind of interesting to watch us go through this moment when institutions really, you know, when they had to send their students home during the beginning of the COVID crisis, um, they weren't in a financial position to offer any sort of refunds. I mean, that's the real reason they didn't offer any refunds or reduce, you know, tuition um, during that period. Um, but you also saw them saying things like, oh, no, no, you're still getting yeah. the, the valuable education that's associated with our brand. And so it was a bit of talking out of both sides of their mouth because, um, you know, you can't say that you know, not the value of what you're getting is is less now, even though you're sitting at home in your parents' basement learning through your laptop instead of on campus floating down the lazy river, <laughs> sipping lattes in the cafe, right? I mean, and then of course now again selling those as being an important part of the experience. Um, you yeah, know, I think it's all a bit murky what it where the value is created in education, and I think that murkiness. Um, plays to the advantages of institutions. Um, we, we can't tell as researchers and individuals can't tell as potential students which aspect of the educational experience is what drives the return. And, um, you know, it makes it hard for people to price things out and know what they should be willing to pay. And so I want to backtrack a little bit because you already addressed the fact that people, you know, believe that an undergraduate education is kind of the essential factor. And, and I guess I, I maybe I'm underselling it by saying people believe because as you've kind of discussed in other places, in a lot of cases, that is true. It just leads to a massively increased uh, amount of earnings. Mm -hmm. um, and and yet, as you've kind of alluded to earlier as well, so much of the debt outstanding is held by people with graduate degrees. And so how has policy been kind of addressing that divide, mm. that kind of dissonance? Yeah, I mean, that's part of the challenge is that we have one higher ed system of finance um, and we try to treat education after high school as if it's a monolith. And it's clearly not. I mean, the labor market returns on, you know, one year certificate program versus an associate's versus a bachelor's degree versus a master's degree. I mean, these are wildly different animals. And the idea that we're financing all of them through the same system, um, you know, using similar, if not the same rules, is probably getting us a little bit into trouble. I mean, especially, um, you know, even within undergraduate degree programs, it, you know, it, it People spend so much time thinking about which institution 
is the best institution for them. And we talk about fit and, you know, it's a huge, you know, p portion of like the high school experience for some American students to be thinking about where they want to go and, and where they're going to end up. It turns out financially speaking, what matters far more than that is what you study. Um, the variation in outcomes across majors is far more than the variation in outcomes across institutions. So, um, you know, we, we need to be thinking about that as policymakers more than we do, and individuals need to be thinking about that as well. Uh, and we probably need to be thinking more about how to start differentiating the financial systems across undergraduate and especially graduate programs and maybe even within um, sub-degree programs as well. Yeah, and you've also kind of talked about, um, or I know you and I have discussed together, the shifts in how much information we actually have about some of these programs. Um, can you talk a little bit about how much information students actually have about that when they apply and uh, if it can be improved? Yeah, so when I went to college, you know, we, we had this like telephone book like index of colleges that were ranked by US News and World Report or something like that and some limited information about what the campus was like and things like that. Um, there's been a tremendous innovation in the amount of data that's available to students, um, of course, because of the availability of the internet, but also because of something that happened during the Obama administration, which was the creation of a website called the College Scorecard. That's a website that has an index of all the colleges that participate in federal student aid. Um, but the real value in that website is that it tells you how much people earn coming out of each program or major within each of those institutions. So for the vast majority of students who report that the number one reason they're going to college is to increase their earnings potential, that should be the first stop when you're looking at where to go and what to study. Um, so we've come a, a really long way in being able to empower aspiring students to shop for their education after high school, you know, using the previous experiences of students who have gone to the programs that they're considering. Um, we don't see that people are using it as much as I think they should, given what they report as their values and priorities in going to college. Um, but I don't think we've also talked to people about college as something that you should be a critical or careful consumer of. You know, we've talked instead about the bachelor's degree as just this commodity that is a golden ticket to prosperity when in fact bachelor's degrees come in all shapes and sizes. Some of them do deliver economic well-being very consistently while others deliver unaffordable debt quite consistently. And so we need to start telling people that when you think about going to college, you need to think about what your values are. And if your values are about being able to support yourself and a family financially when you finish, then this is the way that you need to select what you're going to study and where you're going to go. Yeah. And it's sort of another interesting question because Obviously, if you go to, you know, like a Princeton, for instance, like the the amount of potential, like you can make a lot of money because that's, you know, if you decide to go into investment banking or something from there, people have the potential to make a huge amount of money uh, from some institutions and from some programs within institutions. But are there institutions that we've been seeing are consistently bad actors in this space? In other words, we've already talked about the the kind of demand side that there are a certain subset of students and borrowers who are kind of being particularly hammered down by our current system. Um, but on the supply side, are there also a particular or like any sets of actors that are kind of particularly, <laughs> particularly harmful? Yeah, so there definitely is. I mean, if we look at the outcomes for students, um, we see that for-profit institutions have not well served the students that have enrolled with them over the past decade or two. Um, outcomes for students have been poor at community colleges, but community colleges charge low prices. Right. So you don't end up in a huge pile of debt, just a small pile of debt. Um, 
But we also, you know, there are, it's certainly the case that there are programs of study at even well celebrated institutions um, that have poor economic outcomes for their graduates on a consistent basis. Um, I don't have any to, to call out today. That would be fun. Oh, but that's disappointing, Beth. <laughs> well, I want you to name names. <laughs> when I'll name, I'll name a name for you. So when the uh, Obama administration actually introduced some regulation that tried to um, be a bit more aggressive in policing programs that claimed to be career oriented in their mission. Um, what happened was they were, they were really trying to target these for-profit institutions that had had a track record of poor student success. And, you know, when they came out with these regulations, basically trying to kick out programs of study that didn't equip people with the skills or the credential to, you know, make a wage that would justify their cost or allow them to pay back their their loans. What happened is that they, on the application of that um, regulation, they also ended up picking up some programs of study at private nonprofit institutions, like I believe it was the uh, performing arts program at Harvard that also was considered to be included um, in that regulation. And I think not surprisingly, it was found that the earnings of students coming out of that program did not justify the upfront cost of enrolling at Harvard. Um, Go figure. Oh my yeah. gosh, most people didn't <laughs> expect it to when they went in. Um, yeah. But, you know, that's important to realize. And um, we don't have a regulatory framework right now that calls out programs of study more broadly that meet that criteria or don't meet that criteria. But I think that's something we should work on and we should be naming names as we just yeah. said. <laughs> no, totally. I mean, and it's interesting also because. I- Politically, I kind of wonder if the left is going to be able to muster the the gumption to do that just because mm-hmm. so much of their, as, as you've kind of also commented on in the past, like so much of this being a, a politically motivated, politically charged issue includes right. saying it's all about the students and not thinking as much about the institutions. I don't know if you kind of have yeah. any thoughts on that or see a way forward through that. I do. You know, I think a lot of people find the idea of, you know, measuring return on investment, you know, individual return on investment from college programs to be like a really um, off-putting notion. And and it's the idea that, you know, college should be more than just a training ground for jobs, right? Um, And I appreciate that. But I also appreciate that, you know, most people in the U.S. economy don't have the luxury of being able to choose to enroll in an institution without concern over whether or not it provides a sufficient return to justify the cost. So I think the compromise is that you say, like, look, policy shouldn't and our rhetoric shouldn't seek to maximize return on investment, but rather we should seek to identify institutions and programs where the return on investment is negative or, you know, just not sufficient, right? If, if, an, if a program of study leaves you worse off yeah. financially, to me, that's a no brainer, right? And so that's kind of like the low hanging fruit that I think we can get people on board with yeah. across political lines, because I don't think anybody believes that a program that leaves someone worse off financially than before they came is really doing a service to that student or to society. And so, you know, I think that's the place to start. Yeah, absolutely. And so I want to draw back. We started off talking about the Biden plan. I want to go back to it because there's a Mm -hmm. lot to discuss there that we haven't yet had the chance to unpack. Uh, But as I was looking at it, a couple of things stood out to me. I mean, first, that it's capped at $125,000 for income. That's a really high cap. And in fact, on their own fact sheet that they themselves published about it, They said, and I quote, no relief will go to any individual or household in the top 5% of incomes in the United States, which 5%. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Like, yeah, it's it's not a particularly aggressive cap on income. I mean, I think that the White House would probably responding to criticism from people like me and those opposed to these widespread cancellation who had said, like, look, this is a giveaway to the rich. And so by at least cutting off some of the richest people from the eligibility pool, 
I think that allows them to, you know, eliminate that talking point. Yeah. <laughs> to be frank. And, and it's, um, you know, it doesn't do a lot to make the program less regressive than it already is, but um, it does something. And so I think that was, I think it was more about the resulting rhetoric right. from the intervention than it was about crafting a more nuanced policy intervention. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, although it feels to me almost that like, once you've reached 5%, you're admitting that you can be in the 90th percentile and still receive, which is kind of a crazy admission, honestly. Like, I, if I were the one writing this, I would be not mentioning that, you know? I think so, too. I mean, I think people can see through what the White House has done here. And I... You know, you have seen that, you know, a lot of moderate Democrats aren't thrilled with what's happened. Obviously, Republicans and conservative minded folks have rejected the plan out of hand. But, um, you know, I do think even more moderate people who believe that there is room for government intervention of some sort, even maybe a generous intervention, um, you know, are a little bit, you know, put off by the way that this was crafted. The other piece of it that I think is easy to skip over, but that I want to ask about is the fact that Pell Grant recipients receive twice as much money. And this might be sort of a silly or like basic question, but it just struck me as like a very odd detail because you're, if you're a Pell Grant recipient, that implies that you've already kind of been privileged within the system. Like you've already received a grant, you've already received a certain amount more money, and yet they're getting twice as, as much relief what what's the thought process behind that what does that mean yep so the idea there is that they're again trying to do a program that's not really like hugely means tested or complex but we're trying to overcome the fact i believe that just flat widespread forgiveness ends up being a regressive policy and so if you give more money to people who received pell grants when they were in college you're giving money to people who came from more money to people, excuse me, to people who came from the less well-off households. And since we know that, you know, income and wealth persist across generations, you end up getting that more of that money is going to less well-off, you know, people based on their current income as well. And so again, that was an attempt to try to overcome the fact that flat widespread forgiveness, um, you know, benefits disproportionately higher income borrowers. Interestingly, Brookings just released a study looking at those um, those award levels and found that because so many of the people who were Pell eligible when they were in school have low balances today, the amount that the federal government will end up spending on Pell recipients versus non-Pell recipients is actually about the same. And so it doesn't end up actually correcting for the hmm. regressivity of the of the intervention. So um, I get what they were doing, but I think there were much, <laughs> much, much better ways to do it. Yeah. Interesting. OK, that that was very helpful because I was very confused when I saw that. And it also like rhetorically, it's sort of like the footnote. You know, where they're like, mm -hmm. oh, it, and then all the headlines, it says $10,000. But then you read the yeah. print and you're like, wait a minute, 20. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't. <laughs> right. And another motivation may have been to further support the effort to address racial wealth inequality. Because, you know, that was always a talking point of motivating um, the calls for loan cancellation. But if you look at the numbers, I mean, the majority of people receiving the, these benefits are white Americans. And so um, skewing the award amounts to disproportion, you know, disproportionately greater rewards to people who came from less well-off households um, when they were in school can can help to address that fact and, and put more of the resources into the hands of um, black borrowers. And so I'm not sure how much it does that. I'm not sure we have the analysis yet on that. Um, but, you know, I think that was probably the goal as well. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's also kind of, yeah, another tricky piece of it because that's such for, from, from a Democrat perspective, such an important part of like their platform and the way that they've kind of been packaging a lot of this stuff. Right. Yep. Yep. So, so if, if we zoom out a little bit, um, we've already talked a little bit about the fairness element of the effect that this bill is going to have. We've talked about um, how 
how it's regressive um, and how people are going to, you know, not be receiving an amount that's probably fair in, in terms of forgiveness, in terms of how much risk they've taken on and how much they're earning now and, and factors like that. Um, but when we talk about how it affects everyone, like how it affects the taxpayer, how it affects in inflation, do you think that this bill is going to have consequences that are wider reaching than just affecting the people who took out the loans? Yes. So, you know, obviously I'm, I'm happy for all the people out there who are going to get the money from these loans. I would love to get 10 or $20,000 from the federal government myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't want to take anything away from those people. You're doing the right thing and, you know, you didn't do anything mm -hmm. wrong except that money. Um, but it is going to cost taxpayers. I mean, this is not, not money that can come out of thin air. I think that's a misconception that because this is government lending program that not having to pay back doesn't actually cause us to have to raise any more new money. Anyway, I, I, I seem to keep hearing this argument over and over, um, you know, from people who are casual observers of the space, you know, saying that this doesn't actually cost us anything. It does. It costs us a lot of money. And what it means is that the money that, you know, the things that we would have spent those dollars on in the future need to be funded through some other means. So either we need to raise more taxes or we need to cut spending on other programs or, you know, cut spending overall um, to pay for what is this lost revenue from the incoming student loan or payment. And it's, you know, to the tune of like half a trillion dollars. So it's a, a huge sum of money. The other piece about inflation, I'm less worried about. It's a talking point today because we're in an inflationary environment and it is the issue du jour, you know. Um, but if you look at the magnitude of, you know, the, the dollars that are being injected into the economy um, in the current moment, because remember, this isn't like people are getting a check for ten or $20,000. This is writing off a balance, which means it changes their monthly payment or eliminates a monthly payment. So on a monthly basis, like a current time basis, the impact is much lower on um, the demand for you know, consumption. And so the inflationary impact is going to be modest. Um, I think that if this were good policy, I would say that the inflationary impact shouldn't stop us from doing it. Um, but there's so many other reasons why this is a bad policy that, you know, that even that modest inflation is just another thing to throw on the pile as a reason why this was um, not the right thing at not the right time. Again, kind of, uh, kind of zooming out a bit. Uh, we've kind of talked about the ways in which the system is, isn't is working um, and the fact that just sort of one-time forgiveness doesn't really address the long term. I mean, so one, do you think it's going to have any impact in the long term, even if it's inadvertent? And two, what do you think we can do to kind of address the underlying issues that, that are causing this? Like, what what doesn't this bill do that it should? Well, I mean, I think what it's going to do is exacerbate the challenges that we're already facing, right? I'm really worried about the problem of moral hazard. So if we've just sent the message that federal loans are not required to be paid back, um, you know, of course, people aren't going to borrow, you know, every penny because it's like a, a sure thing that they want to pay back. But there's definitely a sense now that federal loans don't need to be paid back in full, at least, right? We, just, we don't know exactly what that'll look like, but certainly going to pe encourage people to borrow more. It's certainly going to in encourage institutions to raise prices. Um, and so that's a really big problem um, that imposes a huge tax or huge cost on taxpayers who pay for these bailout programs. It also creates a lot of uncertainty and economic risk for the students who are taking out the loans with the hopes that they end up getting paid back. I really think that we need to rein in borrowing in our current system, you know, fixing it on the front end. I'm le I'm really not hugely concerned about the amount of debt people are taking for undergraduate programs. Mm. I mean, the max you can get as a dependent student is $30,000. An independent student, I think it's something in around $55,000 now. And those are reasonable sums to pay back over the course of your career, um, you know, if you are in a degree program with a decent return. Um, it's really the graduate debt that is, you know, imposing the huge costs on taxpayers, you know, through these relief programs. And so first thing I would do would be to, you know, either have a huge cutback in the availability of funds through grad for grad plus loans, 
um, or maybe even can eliminate that program altogether. Um, and I think the private sector would step up and make those loans in the absence of a federal program. Um, so I think that's that's what needs to be done. But we need to um, definitely rein in how much students are able to borrow on the front end and also start looking at restraining institutions or programs of study with bad outcomes from continuing to participate in the federal student loan program. That's a really interesting note. And I think, again, just like when I've looked at this issue, such kind of a thought provoking fact that so much of the debt is held by people with graduate degrees. Um, I think it really affects mm -hmm. at least the way that I think about uh, how to address this issue and the way that it's been addressed so far. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much, Beth. This has been super interesting. I really appreciate you taking the time. Of course. It's a pleasure to talk with you. Well, there you have it, Madisonians. Dr. Beth Akers explaining fact from fiction when it comes to student loan forgiveness. Don't forget to follow us and, if the spirit moves, leave us a rating or review. Our website is JMP. Dot Princeton dot edu. Our Twitter handle is at Madison Program, and you can also find us on Facebook and Instagram. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time here on Madison's Notes.